Dick Mills. Yeah. We're going to try and do something a little bit different today. Um, around about 50 years ago, Dick, you were working on the signature tune for a little known program. Yeah, that wasn't expected to last more than six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what we'd like to ask you to do is to basically go through this piece of music bit by bit. Okay, we'll try, we'll try. Um, and 50 years dims the memory somewhat, <laughs> uh, but I can probably come up with enough excuses. <laughs> I've had 50 years to practice. <laughs> Trust me, we'll believe anything you say. Yeah. It's, it's... Yeah. Okay, so um, I've got to make something very clear. These are not the original um, radio phonics from Dilly Derbyshire. Um, they're locked away in market safe in limbo, in the limbo of another universe, in fact. Um, these were recovered, if you like, by three people Ian Stewart, Danny Stewart, and Peter O'Rourke. And since about 2004, 2005, They've been getting various versions of Dealey's theme, running them through filters and colanders and sieves, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> separating the complete versions of the theme into their individual parts, bass line, uh, yeah, yeah, melody, yeah, yeah. etc. So um, I just had to make that one clear. These are not the originals. Okay, so um, do you fancy a grace note? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Little little nods later. Now let's say right from the outset there's several myths that surround <coughs> the workshop and Doctor Who in particular. At the end of the first episode you will have seen signature tune by Ron Grainer and underneath Radio Point Workshop. Ron Grainer visited the workshop twice, once with the first piece of paper, and secondly when he came back after a fortnight or so when Delia and I played him the end result. Uh, Ron never worked at the workshop. Also at that time the workshop didn't have any specialist equipment at all for music production or manipulation. I've got some paint on there because of the microphones. Uh, old habits die hard. Um, there were no synthesizers, there were no sequences, there was no multi-tracks, there was not even stereo. Uh, and there was certainly no means for keying in uh, oscillators. There were no envelope shapers. Uh, sine waves, which are theoretically the purest known form of audio, were complete unhandleable if you used at the convention mixing desk in those days because they were mixing desks with knobs that had a row of studs and a traveller on the back of them and every time you faded them up you could up with a side wave as the sound you could go click 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 around the studs so that was very difficult you could that meant you couldn't necessarily mix them totally good you, you had to have a, an accompanying <coughs> atmosphere with them to, to paper over the cracks. Later on, and I'll jump ahead just to get it out of the way, <laughs> and you can cut and paste it into wherever you want it, um, we developed what we called the glow pop fader. <clears throat> like it sounds, it's something to do with light. They were quadrant faders on the desk, but when you did that, you weren't varying the... And slide, slide and slide forward. Yes, or yeah. well, whatever. Funny, those in television faded off that way, those in radio faded that way, don't know why. When you did that, you didn't actually fade the sound directly. You actually altered the brilliance of a lamp, which was coupled to a photoresistive cell that did fade the sound. And any click, click, click in the studs of the fader were absorbed by the filament of the bulb which was kept on a minimum glow all the time. Not enough to let any sound through, but just absorb the click, click, click. And then you could fade as pure a sound as you wanted to without any trouble. Okay? That's quite remarkable. Well, that's just <laughs> analogue again, isn't it? I mean, everything is analogue. Now, what do we have at our disposal? 
we had a piece of 22 inch BBC grey panel trunking cover about that wide along which we mounted the single steel wire string if you like which was doing 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 we also had a guitar fret with some four or six strings on with magnetic pickups onto jacks rather than so we could record it directly rather than audibly um, and then we had our audio generators now that we had 12 Jason oscillators which were bought at places like Lasky's or Radio Shack or whatever they had a complete sort of sweet knob and it's all very floppy and flexible and it didn't bear any resemblance to the readings on the dial you had to know you had to mark the dial with a china graph pencil for the same note on in different place on all of them and then we had a thing called a wobulator, which has probably gone down in history, <laughs> which is a huge oscillator in a wooden box, a big circular dial, completely circular dial, a knob that went all the way around if you could do it with a wrist movement in one. It also had a built-in modulator, and it was used for, for instance, if we were going to turn this into a recording studio, you would have this thing on the middle of the table warbling away to over various sweeps of different frequency ranges to pick out any standing waves that the, the room might generate. I mean this one because it's got a trapezoid shapes and things. Um, so, but that gave you a good sort of uh, easy sweep of back in one movement and of course it was great for a science fiction alarms, you just switched it on and set the wobble to whatever speed or depth you wanted it and that was your your alarms done rather than chopping up bits of tape. So the, apart from that, oh we had a white noise generator as well. And that was it. So Ron gave us the music, the script, the score rather, and DJ got on with it. Now the first bit that we heard there, these have little brace notes. If you say to somebody, can you sort of give us a clue as to the rhythm of Doctor Who theme? And they all go, da 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 which is fine, but on the beginning of each of those da 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 there's a little meep, meep on the front of each note, which is a, a, a sort of hidden gem. Uh, basically, there are three... Um, we've only got two, unfortunately, because we couldn't separate the actual clock bass line to upper and lower octave. So we've got... No, no, no. How, how many basic lines, complete basic lines have you got? I, I usually tell the story that there's, we, we made them on three separate reels of tape. The bass, the melody, and the twiddly bits. Oh, no, on my top. And um, they've, they've been separated. Oh, right. But, but, but yeah. talking generally, and this is only because we had three tape machines to play off, uh, and another one to record the master on, we were limited to what we could do, number of tracks. We didn't have multi-tracks, but we didn't have multi-tracks, we were all on different machines. Bit. Fifteen fingers at once. Oh, no, stuff. no, no, it's they were too far apart for you to do your legs and your nose to start three machines. <laughs> there, was a, there was a theory in BBC Studios that if you put all the machines on remote and then put the red light on, all the machines would start at once. Theory. No, they did in, in the majority of cases, but we didn't do that. Delia and I stood there and said, one, two, three, go, you're late. <laughs> you know, one, two, three, you're early. You know, but we got it right in the end. But we would manually start three with the three mm. component layers. Okay. Okay. So we've got the grace note. We've also got the basic bass line. Yeah. That's the plucked. That's the plucked string, which she would have recorded and then moved up and down the frequency scale by banging it on a loop and adjusting the speed. Okay, and um, chuck the two together. Yeah, you get the great snap kick. No, no. And of course, if, if you were doing this to a cast of idiots, well, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you were doing it to a cast of people who were not uh, musically astute or quite quick enough to get it, you could actually accent the grace notes, make it louder so they could hear it, you know, 
So that, but it, I assure you, it is there. Now, the, um, there's an emphasis on the melody. Good God. Um, I'm not quite sure how you made this. Whoops. Whoops. I've got to de-solo something. There we go. Right, so this is for the main melody statement. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, now. What um, on earth was that? That is apparently the, the emphasis on the melody. Yes, but I can't try to think what she made it from. No. Mellotron? Yeah, yeah. Mellotron. The... No. Melodica. Okay. It began with an M. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a mouth organ ish, like with piano keys down yeah, yeah. that you blew end on. It wasn't a mouth organ Larry Adler way. So she may have done that because I know she made that. She used that in Family Car as well. Because that that comes over both bits of the melody plus. Is it a bridge, a middle eight, or a second part? Probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Depends which we need to do it in a fortnight. Then, after that, there's something people will find familiar. Oh, now that is the... The oscillator. The oscillator. And that would be Delia being very dexterous and doing the individual sweeps and then cutting them together and then putting a bit of uh, air and around it. And the pair of you, I mean, I don't think we're just doing it, you sat down and discussed it between you. But how did you decide what noise for what part? Well, we were given a visual-ish. We'd seen this sort of, or did it, was it the other way around? Were they inspired by us, as they say? Well, they, they had to be, let's, let's say they had to be uh, far enough apart frequency-wise to make any difference. So you've got, obviously you've got the base. You've got your, I mean, probably in those days, everybody associated science fiction music with some sort of angelic, dare I say it, soprano-ish mm -hmm. sort of pitch rather than... The most 50s yeah, films and yeah, everything. Rather the than the, the village people or something like mm -hmm. that. So it was a bit... Dudley Simpson. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> he, had a, he had a sort of uh, voice of it... Um, uh, what's the word? Hmm. Collection of words all his own. If he wanted a low trajectory sound, he meant low frequency. And if he wanted a, a, a wafty wafty voice, it was an ethyl real voice rather than ethereal. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Who is this woman, ethyl real? He said, Oh, she's the one with a high voice. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's great how these things. Suddenly, take. I can't hear a, a female voice, so that's Ethel. Ethel, really. <laughs> you know? So, obviously, we decided, or Delia decided, let, let's put it on the line. Delia was the creative person, mm -hmm. I was the technical waller who assisted in whatever she wanted to do, whether it was join these 32 notes up or plug this up or do that. Um, we just happened to do it in the same room, in room 12. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the top line with when you see the original video, it's I call it slip scanning. Whether it is or not, I don't know. It's like a, two, a mirror image of the top and the lower half of the picture of camera feedback. That's, that's the howl around. Sorry? Howl around. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Howl around as well. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, in radio, we call it feedback. Television, they call it howl around. And then they brought out a piece of equipment called the PA stabiliser. So that when the mayor was opening a fate, he said testing, 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 and the loudspeaker was louder than the microphone, all the PA stabiliser did was shift the frequency of whatever he was saying, either upwards on his own feedback path or downwards, so that it just disappeared rapidly out of the audio spectrum. But that became very useful and when Roland, or whatever it was, brought them out in a rack-mounted version, it, it became this fairy dust machine. And we used uh, that PA stabiliser on a downward curve to treat the voice of Marvin the robot, whose diodes were rusted down the right-hand side. Uh, so that everything he said ended on a... And that was just this machine. I mean, he could talk as cheerfully as he's like. I mean, I don't know why he didn't 
call it the misery box on the end. <laughs> <laughs> on that setting, you know, you have misery. On the other end, it would be Australian inflection. <laughs> 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 yeah. It will all be done with, a, with this box. But those are the three basic components, aren't they? There's the, the singing yeah, also melody. The melody, the bass line, and... Well, that's quite nice. And that's backwards. Yeah. What's the difference between white and pink noise? Filtering. White is theoretically all the frequencies, you know, at random. Pink noise is a filtered over a separate, a certain range. And then you've got brown noise, which I think is a totally different thing altogether. <laughs> and then you people label things for the want of doing it. I don't know why. Fair but, uh, you know, white noise, pink noise could be somebody with uh, a hearing problem listening to white noise. I mean, my grandson is colour blind. Now, it's no good asking him what colour he thinks the grass is, because to our sort of viewpoint, we can't imagine the grass anything but green, but that's only the name we give the colour we perceive grass as, but we don't know what colour he perceives it as. Because I think he's in the red and the brown problem areas. I think colour blindness comes in sort of various uh, bands of disability. Not allowed to work on electricals or drive cars on it on aeroplane, not on airfields. Because you might get traffic lights mixed up in the wrong colour. Or if you're wiring something, you might wire it the wrong way round. Good, clever stuff. Hmm. Did you realise there was something special at the end of it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of what? No, of course, of course we didn't. I mean, let's face it. We we went to see Verity Lambert <coughs> at uh, Ealing Film Studios, and she said, "You know why you're here. We obviously going to need the workshop." to do some sounds for Doctor Who. This is going to be a, a sort of children's programme. Uh, they're going to alternate it subject matter wise between scaling the life out of them and, and teach them something. So you'll get science fiction, one story, and then historical thing, the next. And it'll probably run for about six weeks, something like that. But what I really want is a good teacher. So he said, ah, oh, might be able to help you there. Really? Yes. We've been working with Ron Grainer, who at that time was the dog's anatomy in uh, music, you know, the signature tunes. He did Tom Comedy Playhouse, Steptoe, May Gray, Prism, and so on. Yeah, all that, right? And we've just worked with him. She said, have you? He said, yeah. He came to see us, because he was doing a film called Giants of Steam, about the demise of steam locomotives. And he came to us, he said, I want you to prepare up to about 10 minutes or so of these rhythms, call it different tempi, as they say. But they're all based on clankety clank, whoosh, whistle and two two sort of thing, to your own making, but these are the these are the rhythms I want. So we said, okay, we gave him these rhythms. He took them downstairs and used them to build into the music for this, instead of music for this film. And what happened, one, one good sequence, you've got this uh, mallard type engine logo, I think it was Silver Fox actually, hurtling along, which great triumphal music, and then they just slow the music track down. And as it goes down, the rhythm, the ch -ch 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 sort of things get bigger and, and slower, and the more further you, you let it go down in speed, the bigger they get. And then it mixed across visually into these great big engine sheds where they're actually settling, cutting all these low coast bits. So we said, Ron, we know Ron, he, we've worked for him, if you like, and he's happy. We'd be sure he would come on board. So he turned up with a bit of paper and then left and left it to us. He came back, we played it, he said, did I write that? And he said, very nearly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the rest is, well, yeah. So, yes.
originally in August, 50 years ago, with God, um, you had a, a version which was deemed too perfect. Now, that's a sort of, there's a sort of uh, adage, I think you'd call it, um, and we coined it in desperation after Malcolm Clark bored us with yet one more remix of something that he was doing. And somebody said, for God's sake, Malcolm, stop polishing the polish. And we said, a good rule is for anybody doing something is get something that you're pretty good of. Good, very ple quite pleased with you think. Oh, it only needs another little gnats and, and we'll be there. Don't go any further. If anything, go back one step and that will be the best. Because your creativity will have been at its height. After that, you're just trying to improve the curve of view of it. You know, just help sell it. It's done its job, but you want people to say, this must be good because it looks good. We don't need that. So, yes, there isn't, uh, there are no, there's no rules that say you've got to toil on something for different, seven different stages until it's right. It's, when you think it's really, really right, then you've gone past it. Okay, the reason I ask is because I thought you got asked, or oh, Julie might have felt it's too good, it's too perfect, we need to go back a step to the truck <laughs> and make it a little bit more human. Now, now that is, we ought to have a, a quiet rumination here of this profundity coming across. That's what you call it. No, 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 <laughs> seriously, seriously, you don't, you don't, probably don't realise what you've said. We had John Baker with us as a member of staff. He was a gifted jazz pianist. He could do things musically without even thinking about it. He was a desperate alcoholic. Um, it's come to light that he was probably one who walks on the other side of the river, as they say in Germany. Um, but he had this gift of being able to cut tape off the beat. He would make all his music out of speeded up or slowed down components and everybody knows that a minimum is two crotchets and a quaver is two halves, you know. So everything is mathematically thin. So you think, as long as he cuts in multiples of two, it'll be all right. Well, it won't, but it'll sound too perfect. It'll sound as though it's come out of a machine, robotic. John could just cut a little eighth of an inch either side of the cup and, and give it a, a bit of a feel. So that is very, What's the word? Perceptive of you to say, were we worried that it was going to be too perfect? Not with our equipment, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't this August mix that was. No, we didn't. Huh? Now, how are you going to mix these things? Well, obviously, one, two, three, go, and you've got it in sync. Then one of you's got to nip back to the mixing panel uh, and sort of do the internal. Balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you do if there's a bum note? You've got to stop, discover where it is on the tape. Yes. You've got three lines of tape going through. Each tape is full more splices than there are yeah. whatever. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Easy. You probably haven't seen the picture of Mavo Studios. It is a very, very long corridor. Yes. And a very long building because it was an old roller skating rink and uh, where you sat around the balcony to watch the skaters while the hardcore orchestra played and you took afternoon tea they were all turned into offices on street level side and that's where the workshop was if you walk down this corridor th there's a myth that the other end of the corridor was warwick avenue tube station but it wasn't quite as long as that but allowing for the fact that the seat tube was 30 seconds long, that's not a lot of length of tape at 15 inches a second. It's what, 700 feet or something like that. I said to Delia, come on, pick the spools up, three reels of tape, right, out in the corridor, and roll it down the corridor. Start at this end, da -da 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 -da. sticky joint out of place, that's the one. That's the, that's the bum note. 
Yeah, it, it was, I don't know why it suddenly came to me to, to, to look at it from that, you know, multiple It's a words. physical... A physical thing. Yeah. It, 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 because it was so robotic, if you like, uh, and pre-cut, any bum note would literally stand out. stand out and be in the wrong place. I mean, you couldn't not miss it if even you put different colours sticky tape on it. You're happy with the reception. thing, she says. Oh dear, but yeah. You're happy with the reception you've had with this over the years? Yeah, you see, people want to update it. I Every was going to say, have you seen the latest things? Around, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, well, it was all right, Murray's thing at the proms. It was exciting and vibrant and went with the graphics, so what more can you ask? I mean, it's. Nobody's got, well, I suppose they have got sole copyright or, or should have a say in how if it's used, but I'm sure most composers would be only too delighted that other people take an interest in it, for God's sake. I'm surprised how many remixes of this thing. Yeah, are. I mean, sampled and fiddled about with and things. Absolute. Fantastic. I, I heard the, uh, the reggae version. But, uh, <laughs> well, there's what nothing you're going on the weekend. Really? Well, there's a reggae version. Oh, God. <laughs> I wonder, Dick, oh, sorry, um, Ron Grain's own version is a thing to be heard. Um, it's the theme to Radio Free Scarrow. Oh, that one, That's yes. That's Ron Grain. <laughs> oh, dear. Disco yeah. fat. Fantastic. Disco yeah. No, it's, uh, it, it's surprising, you know, how it has... I mean, I, love, I quite like Peter Howe's version. That, that's pretty good. Kef McCulloch did a version. Um, that scream at the end... At the cliffhanger every oh, I can't remember when that came in, but that certainly um, wasn't a Sorry? 1970. Was it? I mean that wasn't the original. That wasn't there for quite some time. But uh, then there was a one with the endless repeats on the end. Oh dear. I'll tell you a story about things at the end. We did a had to go to the was it the festival hall? Must have been to celebrate the Institution of Electrical Engineers centenary that the Queen attended. And they put the synthesizer of the Delaware on the stage. And we played a lot of stuff. And uh, we also, Delia did the, uh, and I did the audio visual soundtrack. Uh, sorry, the, the audio for the visual soundtrack to celebrate this with the other. But we ended up with the, the, the badge of the Institute and some music that we'd composed. Malcolm Clark was playing the tape and I was up in the dress circle doing the projector for slides of that. <laughs> and it was agreed that we would fade out at the end. So Malcolm's down there and he keeps looking at the screen and there's no sign of it fading. And I'm up in the in the dress circle looking at the picture and listening, so he hasn't faded it yet. And he's waiting for me. <laughs> and I'm waiting for him, so I put it down a bit and then he goes, oh, and he puts it down a bit and we're, we're sort of chasing. <laughs> and it went on for, it's the longest fade out in history. <laughs> yeah, if, only, if only we'd sort of come to a, when I nod my head, hit it sort of arrangement before we started, it'll be fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Mills. It says on the album is Fanfare. Oh, Fanfare, yeah. I think it's from one of the, um, hmm, one of the border stories. Uh, in the, what do they call it? The, you know, not the, the bit between us and Scotland. Low countries is Holland, I know, and Belgium, but... Cumbria? The borders. The borders. They call them the borders. Yeah, <laughs> the borders, that's right. Uh, there was a lot of... Uh, folk stories about <coughs> they wanted Lord Sewell's, Sewell's or whatever his name was, had to have a triumphal pack. I did a Martian March past. God, that's balmy, oh, that is. Sure. Oh, dear. It sounds like a bloke going along with, like, no, it sounds like a centipede with a wooden leg, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> like, 99 plot. It's on the 30 years of the workshop, which I'm fine at that. But it's all, it's funny, we issued a disc, and, 
I suddenly I read it and I thought, that can't be right. I said, the revelation of this, of this disc is, is Dick Mills. We didn't know he did music, and I thought, no, nor did I. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you do, I mean, 